December 1967. The campaign of North Vietnamese General Jup is going badly. The Americans are applying the pressure on a dozen battlefields. His troops are taking mounting casualties and suffering from a loss of morale. He desperately needs a major victory. But the target he selects hands him one of the costliest defeats of the war and gives the Allies spectacular confirmation that a ground battle can be won by air power. Khe Son, an Allied base manned by U.S. Marines and one battalion of South Vietnamese Rangers. Cornerstone of the defense line where the demilitarized zone and the Laotian border meet. The mountains surrounding Khe San overlook the Ho Chi Minh Trail. To Jiap and to some Western observers, Khe San's similarity to Dien Bien Phu make it a lucrative target, one that might bring a victory as decisive as the one that forced the French withdrawal a decade before. Into the area, Jiap moves two full divisions, more than 20,000 men, and positions them to surround the 6,000 defenders. A third division is moved toward the Marine base at Camp Carroll. Battle lines are drawn, and the Marines repulse probes against their tightened perimeter. General William Westmoreland gives his deputy commander for air, General William Momeyer, operational control of all air elements in the defense of Kaysar. On January 19th, the largest and best coordinated air campaign of the war is launched against the enemy. of food, every round of ammunition must be flown in to the besieged marines across an air bridge that is always busy, always dangerous. Enemy gunners score a hit on an A-4 flown by Marine Major Bill Loftus. But Loftus is quickly recovered by marine choppers and returned to Quezon. cargo aircraft become known as mortar magnets, but in spite of the mortars, in spite of enemy anti-aircraft fire, in spite of bad weather, the air bridge is never cut. C-130 and C-123 aircraft deliver nearly 11,000 tons of supplies and move more than 3,000 troops, refugees, and wounded in and out of the base. Their daily load averages as much as an 80-truck convoy. full of Air Force aerial port personnel under constant enemy fire load and offload as many as 30 aircraft in a day. As the supply by air continues, 
the Air Force coordinates intelligence from all sources to pinpoint the enemy positions. Air Force reconnaissance crews are able to penetrate the jungle canopy and zero in on enemy targets with highly sophisticated electronic and photographic devices that detect the enemy's slightest move. They often locate more than 300 targets a day. Jop's plan calls for a quick victory. He steps up the intensity of his assault. Scores are hit on the Marine ammunition dump. On 23 February, 1,300 rounds slam into Quezon. Casualties among the defenders mount. burrow deeper and call for suppressive fire from fighter aircraft. On the airstrip, the airlift planes meet increasing enemy fire. to deliver the goods by parachute. The communists are steadily increasing their attack. The specter of Dien Bien Phu is revived in American headlines. But what the French lacked, the Americans have in overwhelming strength, the decisive element of air power.
around the clock strikes, airborne battlefield command and control centers in modified C-130 aircraft orbit Quezon, enabling the airborne commander on the scene to talk with the Marines on the ground, the fighter aircraft pilots, and 7th Air Force headquarters in Saigon. Armed with the latest target information, the AB-CCCs direct the forward air controllers, who in turn direct the fighter bombers to enemy positions within yards of the Marines' perimeter. B-52s, with their sophisticated radars, are able to strike in any weather, each carrying more than 30 tons of bombs, blast enemy bunkers and supply dumps, devastating the surrounding landscape. At night, unseen and unheard, until their payloads hit, they strike terror into the hearts of the communist troops. The air effort is massive. In February and March, General Momeyer directs more than 21,000 sorties in defense of Quezon. Of these, 2,500 are flown by the B-52s. During the same time period, Marine artillerymen at Quezon and Army gunners firing from bases many miles away lob thousands of shells at the enemy. In March, about the time of the 14th anniversary of his victory at the NBN Fu, Jiap orders the withdrawal of the first of two divisions which are then in the process of being destroyed. At the same time, the monsoon lifts, clearing the skies for a growing stream of airlift and medevac aircraft. Tactical fighters continue their precise attacks, complementing the heavy bombardment of the B-52s increasing the pace of the enemy withdrawal. The Marines move out in pursuit of the enemy. Now the extent of the communist defeat becomes more apparent. The debris left on the battlefield is mute testimony. Stockpiles of ammunition, rockets, mortars, and automatic weapons, laboriously packed down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, are abandoned. Captured North Vietnamese troops provide added facts. One regiment is reported to have lost 75% of its 2,000 men. Mass desertions to escape the bombing are not uncommon. Joff's soldiers were existing on starvation rations. Total enemy losses are estimated at 15,000 men. The long siege is over. On April 7th, the President of the United States sends a message to the armed forces in Southeast Asia. The relief of the forces which have held the base of Quezon is an occasion for me to express the pride and confidence I feel in those who are carrying forward the nation's struggle against aggression in Southeast Asia. The enemy intended to overrun the base at Quezon. Less than 6,000 United States Marines and South Vietnamese Rangers, backed by our tremendous air capacity, pinned them down, kept them away from the populated areas, and imposed heavy casualties. Thank you.